So now it's time for us to listen to the Dhamma. It's the appropriate occasion. And we can practice in a cultivation at the same time. We take up this um, method of developing our minds for the sake of bringing our hearts to peace, to gathering them together into a state of samadhi. We can call this uh, samatha practice, that which calms and stabilizes the mind. Because it's normal uh, for the average person that um, their minds aren't yet very stable and strong. And this uh, collectedness of mind is not enough to be able to see into the Dharma. The Dharma, however, is something which is always open and revealed. And whether an enlightened Buddha comes into this world or not, the Dharma is still there. The element of truth uh, is with us always, regardless. That um, things are this way and they're not otherwise. That because when uh, a cause for something to arises, to arise, then that thing will come up, that thing will arise. And this is what the Buddha found out on his enlightenment. And when there's a cause for something to arise, then that will come up. He saw into this nature of suffering, what it was that causes us to feel uh, stressed and discontented. That avijja, ignorance, is the proximate cause for sankharas to arise. And then from sankhara, there's vedana, feeling, and then uh, clinging. And then there's uh, becoming, birth. And all of this uh, goes into the way that we experience suffering. So we can look at that now here in this present moment and see that when our minds have avijja, ignorance, then this will be a cause for sankhara to arise, for the mind to start thinking and creating things, proliferating, believing in a sense of self and a me and a mine. Then vijnana consciousness uh, arises, and so does physicality and mentality. So whenever we see something, or whenever we hear something, then we take all of that to be me, I'm hearing, I'm seeing. Whenever there's any contact that arises in our minds, it's me who contacts that. There's always this sense of self there. So whenever we experience something, then um, what we're experiencing is either a pleasant feeling, an unpleasant feeling, or a neutral feeling. But regardless of the quality of it, we can build a sense of self around anything. So whenever there's a craving there, then this will be a cause for um, becoming and birth, which leads on to suffering, to old age, sickness, death, sorrow, lamentation, grief, and despair. The Buddha, therefore, taught the way for us to be able to abandon these causes of suffering, to be able to let go of our clinging and attachment. And if we're able to do that, to let go of this attachment to self, then this whole cycle just can't function. There won't be any becoming or birth. And so therefore, there won't be any suffering arising for us. So whenever we attach to uh, any of the aggregates, whether it's uh, rupa, this form, this body, or vedana, feeling, um, sanya, perception, or memory, sankara, thought, or vijnana, sense consciousness, we can see that we easily... Um, go and cling to that. 
So how do we abandon that clinging? When our minds have already gone and attached to it, then how can we let go of that? The Buddha taught right from the very basics. And he said that if we have wealth and possessions, and we're very attached to those, we have built up a a very strong sense of self around that, and we just want more and more, then this is purely greed that's there. We should therefore practice with that and practice dana, practice giving up. Because if we don't, then we'll be able, or what we will experience will be a lot of suffering because we've attached to this, and so there's becoming and birth, and suffering will have to come up. There'll be a lot of difficulty, a lot of fear arising, and this all comes due to the clinging that we have towards our wealth. And when those possessions that we have break, or they degenerate, or they're lost or stolen, then we'll experience great anguish in our hearts. So Lumpo Cha taught that we have to consider things carefully. We have to see that our possessions are broken before they really break. So he would ask, are we intelligent around the way we use things and our possessions? No, when they do break, Are we going to be intelligent enough to not allow our hearts to get involved in that and to suffer uh, because of that? He was teaching us to have mindfulness, to be aware of all of this. Because we're the ones who have gone and exhausted ourselves by trying to obtain these things, to working and getting the money and going and buying these things. So when they change and we suffer because of that, that means that we're not intelligent. Lumpur Cha would have us contemplate and see that the things we own, such as a glass, we need to see that it's broken before it actually breaks, to see that it has this nature of brokenness there within it, even if it hasn't broken yet. If there's one person who uses a glass with this feeling in their heart that it's already broken, and another person, they use a glass, the same glass, but they have a sense of attachment to that and they don't have much wisdom around it, then when that glass actually breaks and it goes according to these characteristics of anicca, dukkha, anatta, of uh, this nature of change and stress and not self, then the person who was able to see it as already broken, they won't experience suffering. But the person who didn't see it in that way, who had a lot of attachment and desire for that glass, then they will suffer because of it. And that shows that they don't have much wisdom there. So we don't have to go and constantly separate things out into the elements, for instance. If our minds already have enough peace and um, they're collected enough together, then um, when we go and attach to something, we can teach ourselves that this is already broken. This is already broken. And Lumpur Cha said that this is the appropriate way for us to practice. For those of us who can um, gain samadhi and can gather our minds together into a single point, where the factors of vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, and ekagada are all there, and the mind is in a very still and calm, peaceful state, then this shows that the mind has enough energy to contemplate in this way. So when we go and feel attraction towards something or aversion towards something, then all we have to do is teach our minds, this is not sure, it's not sure. If we hate or we fear, 
we teach ourselves it's not sure. If there's enough calm and peace and our minds are gathered together enough, then our hearts will believe this. We can teach them in this way and they'll be able to accept that truth. So how we practice is we gain peace of mind and then we take the awareness to look at the mind itself. Whenever any mental impression arises, then we contemplate into that. So seeing that we have eyes and we have ears, we have a nose, a tongue, a body and a mind, then there will be sense contact that comes in through those openings. From that, then vijnana, the sense consciousness, arises and there's a knowing there, knowing that there's a pleasant sensation that's arisen or an unpleasant sensation that's come up. So we have mindfulness at that point, knowing and seeing clearly what has arisen, knowing that there's a feeling of um, a pleasant feeling or an unpleasant feeling or a neutral feeling that has arisen. And these are all bachubana dhammas, these phenomena that occur in this present moment. So when we have our awareness centered in this present moment, looking at our hearts and taking care of them, then we will be able to see this bachubana dhamma. We'll be able to instruct our minds, to guide them, tell them that whatever pleasant thing that we experience that's not sure, it's unstable. Any unpleasant thing is not sure, it's unstable. And this is for the purpose of not allowing our minds to go and attach, attach to anything that we experience, any mental object, and we'll be able to let go. We'll be able to experience Tatanga Vimuti, this temporary liberation from that particular attachment. We'll be able to put that down, that sense object down, and experience this temporary liberation from that. So when we can always follow up on our minds, teaching them throughout the day, always there looking, aware, knowing what's going on in our minds, no matter what we're doing, if we're engaged in our work, then we can also be teaching ourselves at that time following up on our minds, knowing what's going on. And those who are always aware of their minds, taking care of their minds, are the ones who will be able to escape from Mara's trap. So we'll see clearly what's going on internally and not allow um, us to be caught in either liking or disliking. And this right here is the very path that will take us to seeing the Dhamma. Because the mind that is caught in liking is the mind that's gone off the middle way. It's gone on to the path of indulgence and sensuality. And the mind that is caught in disliking has gone off to the path of um being involved in uh, self-mortification. So this middle way, this path of practice that we're all engaging in is gathering our minds here in this present moment and not um, allowing them to go off, not allowing them to attach to anything physical or mental. Because as the Buddha taught, attachment is the cause of suffering. So when we do, when our minds do go and cling onto something that they experience, whether it's um, this body, whether it's feeling or a memory, perception, whether it's a thought or whether it's sense consciousness, then we instruct ourselves that it's not sure, that it's not me, it's not mine. If there's enough energy within if our samadhi is stable and well-grounded enough, then we'll have the presence of mind to be able to see the arising and ceasing of 
all forms of physicality and mentality. This will enable our hearts to let go. And it shows that we're endowed with wisdom at that point. But if the mind is weak, if uh, our presence of mind just isn't there, then our samadhi will also be very shaky. We can try to teach ourselves at that point to tell the mind to not go and attach, to tell it that this thing is not sure, that is not self, but the mind has already gone and attached to it. So at that point, what we have to do is to follow up on the mind, to be looking and observing, to see how it's gone off, whether it's gone off into liking or whether it's disliking. We can try a practice. We can set a stopwatch. Whenever there's a feeling of liking or disliking, we can set a stopwatch in front of us. And ask ourselves, well, how long is this going to take for this particular mood to disappear? Sometimes it's one hour, sometimes it's two hours. And we'll see that we can't really control that time. We can't um, say that it's going to be this exact time before it goes. So then how is this thing really me and mine? And all of the feelings that we've had in the past, when they've gone, whether they're joyful feelings, whether they're painful feelings, where are they now? It's just a phenomena that had arisen at one point. It stayed with us for a while, and then it disappeared, it vanished. But our minds went and attached to that and took us to be the owner of that pleasant or unpleasant feeling. So we have to have an object of awareness here in this present moment. And this is for the reason that the kilesas, the defilements, arise here in this present moment. Venerable Lumpur Cha taught that if there's a mango, but we don't uh, touch that mango to our tongues, if we don't make contact with it, with our tongues, then we don't know whether that mango is sour or whether it's sweet. We won't have any direct knowledge of it. But if we are able to have awareness here in this present moment, then we'll be able to let go of any contact that we experience. We'll have presence of mind. We'll be able to investigate and see that it's all changing. But if our mindfulness and our wisdom, it's insufficient, then we won't be able to let go. So what we then need to do is to carry on with the practice, carry on developing, increase the strength and stability of our minds, to sit in meditation and bring our minds to the breath, watching as it comes in and leaves. When our sati is focused on the breath, on the in-breath, on the out-breath, then this will take our minds towards peace. We'll feel uh, rapture and happiness uh, arise and imbue our hearts. And if we develop this a lot, then we'll experience one-pointedness of mind. And the mind will be very firm and strong at that point. However, it will have to leave that state at some point, and when it does, it'll start to proliferate. It's very important for us to have mindfulness right there at that point where it starts to move and starts to think, following up on those thoughts, knowing what's going on, what kind of thoughts are occurring, teaching ourselves that no matter what our mind um, comes up with, no matter what it conjures up, it's all not sure, it's all unstable. If we can do this well, then we'll be able to gain clear seeing into um, this unstable nature of phenomena. So it's this um, samadhi, this practice of collecting the mind, it's similar to placing a rock on top of grass. Because when our minds are in a state of 
collection and stability, then the chelases just can't arise. But when we leave that state, when we retract from it, that's when the chelases come up. Just as when you take the rock off the grass, then it will start to grow again. So this practice of samatha, this calming meditation, is that which suppresses the defilements. We need to train our minds to have mindfulness, to always be recollecting one of the foundations of sati, whether it's the body, whether it's vedana, feelings, the jitta, the mind, or dharma, phenomena. These are all the basis for our recollection, our sati, these four bases. As we gather more strength to our mindfulness and our minds are imbued with peace, then whenever there's attachment to any rupa or nama, any physicality or mentality, such as our bodies, then we use that mindfulness there to look at what's going on. Asking ourselves, are these bodies really me? Are they something stable? Once they've been born, then they'll have to change. They grow up and then they get old. They become sick and then they die and decay. Is there any me in that process? Where am I in that? If our mindfulness is sufficient, then we'll distinctly see that the body is merely a body. There's no being to it. There's no self. There's no me or other there. When the mind is peaceful and still, then we'll be able to use our um, intelligence and our faculty of contemplation to look into the body. And we'll be able to gain understanding of it bit by bit. It won't just happen at once. But actually, if there is enough strength and energy within our minds, and if we have great sati, mindfulness, if our collectiveness is very firm and strong, then we can just investigate one time and perceive clearly into the nature of Dhamma to see that whatever is of the nature to arise is also of the nature to cease. <laughs>